Hi, and welcome to the Working Differently in Extension podcast. I'm Bob Birch. Great to have you along for today's show. We're going to be talking with a couple of folks from the Department of Entomology at Kansas State University, Associate Professor Brian McCornack. Welcome to the, the podcast, Brian. Oh, thanks for having me, Bob. And Extension Associate Wendy Johnson. Wendy, welcome. Thanks. Good to be here. Brian and Wendy are here because they co-authored an article in the Journal of Extension called Getting Growers to Go Digital, The Power of a Positive User Experience. Uh, That appeared in the most recent August 2016 issue of the Journal of Extension. You can find it at joe.org. And we thought we'd talk a little bit about this. Uh, You know, I think there's some interesting things to talk about here in terms of you know, diffusion of innovation and, and adoption of technology um, that, that might relate to, to extension work broadly. So, uh, Brian, maybe you could start and talk a little bit about what you were really looking at here, because you guys were looking at the adoption of a specific digital tool, right? This, these decision support systems. Can you explain what a decision support system is a little bit? Sure. How much time do we have? Um, so kind of, you know, one way in which we approached it was looking at, you know, some decision tools that we currently give, give growers. And part of that is you take some data from a situation that they have and use that data to apply it to uh, making a decision, but you're kind of using, you know, I mean, it might be environmental conditions. It might be, you know, specific counts from plants, but adding all that up, um, you know, more of a kind of sophisticated algorithm to say, what's the chance or likelihood of spraying and that being an economically important decision or, or deciding not to spray, which is also a decision. Um, and what's, you know, what, what's really the return to me as a, as a grower, or as a consultant. Uh, and you know, there's lots of ways to do that. Most, most traditionally is just paper. We can, we can, we can come up with some great algorithms um, to help make those, make those decisions a little easier. Um, but given the technology age, we, 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 we took that, took that twist and then then said, well, what is the advantage of using um, some of these more um, electronic tools to, to help make those decisions? And that was really the basis for that particular, well, at least the article. And so, Wendy, you guys were looking at, you know, I think Brian mentioned spraying. You were looking particularly at a pest management kind of a application here, right? Correct. Yes. And then I, I would also add that Uh, with these mobile support systems, um, we're interested in learning how extension personnel as well as growers might be willing to share. um, Because we know when we get on our mobile phones, it's all about sharing data. And uh, we're really trying to understand if they're willing to share pest management information, or maybe not even the record, you know, the, the management decision that they made, but rather the presence of a pest in their area, can we use that information to help understand risk for farmers around them who may not be thinking in terms of getting out to their field and scouting and thinking if they need to make a treatment decision or not? So I think you've, you've alluded to a little bit, Wendy, but why is, that, why is that important? And is that something that you guys are focused on? How do we get growers to, to share the information? Well, I actually, I would take it away from the study that, that we're talking about today. And um, another project that we're working on is in sugarcane aphid. And what we're, what we're hoping to do on a multi-state project is understand if people are willing to share present state of sugarcane aphid, can we predict, um, um, or can we show in real time, sorry, um, the movement of sugarcane aphid and alert users, whether that's extension or, or farmers themselves, that this is coming your way, get out into your field and start scouting. So they can see the benefit of sharing their data uh, in terms of an, an early warning system. And so, a, and a potential benefit of using it is coming up with a decision quicker or making a more, uh, not necessarily informed decision, but maybe the correct decision because they didn't have to add up all the columns and make sure that they were in a don't treat, keep sampling or, or treat situation. So that's, that's the combining of the digital tool with kind of the paper resource, but now what do you do with that information is can others benefit from you sharing that? And that's what I think Wendy is, you know, a nice job describing is that that's the regional effort that's going on. So in Kansas, for example, sugarcane aphid doesn't overwinter here. So what really does happen in Texas through Oklahoma to Kansas matters. Uh, So if somebody's going to use a sampling tool south of us and reports that they have it, knowing where and when that occurs becomes really important for management decisions here uh, a couple states away. Uh, But kind of getting back to the paper, what our original intention was, was 
okay, there's, there's a lot of people that, you know, a lot of consultants or growers know how to sample for green bug in wheat. Um, but they might not know is how to incorporate a natural enemy. And what becomes even more challenging is putting those two together on a sheet of paper and then coming up and calculating the correct decision at the end of all this. So uh, at least the power of, the, of a positive user experience was, okay, let's show you what you, how you did this in the past. Uh, we're going to show you how to do this now with a digital tool. And hopefully that's improved experience. But by now sharing that digitally, um, that now informs not just you in the room, but informs everybody else in the room that might give you more confidence that, hey, I had a treat decision, so did 10 other people in my county uh, that were sampling around the same time. So it's kind of that connecting of not just, hey, we can make this easier, but now that we've made it easier, we're asking you to share it, but here's the value in sharing that information. So, Wendy, uh, usually when we talk about uh, Journal of Extension articles on on the podcast, we we try and avoid the whole methodology thing. But I think <laughs> it's not the most exciting all the time. But I think there is something really interesting in what you guys did because w w as you were studying this, you know, how do you get somebody to use these tools uh, when you don't know if there are going to be insects present or not? So, can you explain a little bit about the uh, how you uh, simulated uh, that uh, for your study, the whole idea of, of finding or spotting insects in the... Uh, in sure. the Absolutely. Um, I can't take credit for it, though, because this is really Brian's idea. But um, we essentially went to Oklahoma State at a crop school um, that was an audience of about 80 to 100 crop consultants, some farmers, some extension, but mostly crop consultants. And... It was winter time, so we can't go out into the field and you know really look at wheat and, and the aphids that are in the wheat or the green bugs that are in the wheat. So what we did was um, put together these little plastic jars of painted soybean seed, and uh, we had certain percentage of that seed painted green to represent a wheat tiller with aphids. And we had a certain percentage that were painted orange in some jars, not all the jars, um, that were meant to represent the natural enemy. And that is, do you want me to go into a little bit more detail on what sure, that natural that'd be great. Yeah. is? <laughs> okay. Um, so the, the, the green bug in wheat is, can, is somewhat suppressed by a natural enemy called, um, a, a, it's a parasitic wasp. And this little parasitic wasp uh, parasitizes the, the aphid or the green bug. And that, that um, green bug is essentially eaten from the out, uh, inside out and it dies, it leaves this little shell behind when the adult wasp emerges from the body and flies away to find a new aphid uh, to parasitize. So you get left with this hardened, or, or this uh, shell of an aphid left on the leaf, and it's kind of orange in color. So what we did to represent some of this natural enemy that's out in the field suppressing these aphid populations was to paint them orange as a mummy. Um, so the, the idea there is that you don't want to spray your field if you have a lot of this natural enemy present in the field because you're going to, first of all, kill them off, and second of all, you're not going to get that suppression if they're dead. So if you have a certain level of those mummies in the field, you don't want to spray because they're going to naturally control the aphid population below the economic threshold. Okay, now where was I? <laughs> <laughs> we were just talking oh, about right. jars. I thought that was pretty good. Yeah. Okay, so we had these jars, you know, where the uh, crop consultants who were working in pairs would simulate this walking through a wheat field and writing down their observations on either the presence of the, the green bug and then the presence of the mummies. And in some cases, you, you could pull out a seed and it was painted both colors so that, you know, there was a lot of action going on in that field. Um, we also we sort of separated it out into um, two fields. The first field was low density of, um, of the green bug Okay, and there was no biocontrol going on. So that was, you know, this, this um, scenario where, I mean, in, in, under natural conditions, you're usually seeing low populations of these green bugs. But then we added in the second field where in some outbreak years, you get these high um, uh, levels of green bug as well as that biocontrol or the um, mummies present in the field. So we teased it apart in these two different scenarios so we could compare, you know, what their observations would be between the two. So the, the jars and simulating, you know, walking through the field, making observations, writing them down on paper, or using our um, smartphone app to um, 
come up with a treatment decision is, is how we studied this. Mm-hmm. And, and Brian, uh, you know, as, as uh, Wendy's explaining it, I think listeners are, are getting an idea that this is, this is a pretty complex operation, right? It's not just a budgeting spreadsheet or something where you're just plugging in numbers and boom, you know, you get a, get some kind of result. Um, can you talk about uh, sort of the complexity of that in using the paper tool and maybe some of the results that you guys found comparing how, uh, you know, the digital tool performed against that in, in terms of errors that were made and those kinds of things? Yeah, I think one of the kind of the easiest ways to think about it is on that sheet, they're, they're giving every question we're going to ask them possible. And so when, they, when, you, when, I, when we put that sheet up, and, the, and the folks from Oklahoma, we're going to blame them, right? When the folks from Oklahoma came up with that, I mean, it really was the kind of the best design to incorporate natural enemies and, and the pests all into one sheet that helps you decide whether you keep sampling or you stop to make a decision. And so I think the you know, way, way we pitched it really to, to this group was, and, and any group after, after that was, we're just going to ask you one question. We're going to add, add a time. And, then, and it's whether or not that tiller has an, an aphid on it, one or more. Can you just classify it? That's our tally threshold. Is this, you stop at one, you're done. And then also we're going to train you what a parasitoid looks like and, or a, or sorry, a mummy looks like. And then once you get to one, you're done. We're just going to ask you that one time, and we're might be dead. now we're going to keep asking that over and over again. But we're asking you one question at a time, and so you know, for somebody who's not really familiar with that, or maybe only looks at it once a year, or maybe every five years when, when they need it, uh, looking at that sheet can become completely overwhelming. Even though that was our best best way of displaying it, going digital again, you can train them, you can kind of reteach them a much smaller level without having to give them everything at once nor do they have to learn how to calculate it. So what you ask them to do is simply, is this infested, yes or no? And then the nice thing about going digital is that all the, all the algorithms and decision is going on in the background. So the program is just gonna keep telling you, keep sampling, keep sampling until, hey, I have enough. This is your decision based on what you told me. The other approach is, here's, every, here's everything. And the overwhelming part is, I'm just going to, it's too overwhelming seems like too much risk, even though it's a really good threshold that includes natural enemies, which isn't really done anywhere, anywhere else, especially in field crops. You know, that's, that's, say, that's a savings of 12 to $15 per acre if you have natural enemies present. Mm-hmm. But looking at, look, looking at a sheet of paper and trying to, and trying to wrap your mind around, what am, I, what am I going to do next to ensure that I'm going to make the right decision, there's less likelihood of adopting that because there's, there's some perceived risk in that. So, it's really that balance, and the nice thing of going digital is we can we can automate that, as long as they know what an aphid looks like, what a parasite, what a mummy looks like, and the tally threshold again is the same as long as it's one or more per tiller. So you train, you know, you don't have to teach them as much. They can still learn more if they want, but again, it's directing them to that decision in a much more efficient way. So, Wendy, did you guys find then? Um I mean, based on the title of your of your paper, I think you know it, we find some adoption here, right? There's some increased adoption based of the digital tool and maybe a, of the planning tool in general, right? Because there's a digital option, is that is that fair to say that mm-hmm. that growers are more likely to use the planning tool at all, paper or digital, because there's an easier digital option? Right. So when we walked into that room that day with the audience of crop consultants and um, asked them if they were going to be willing to uh, try this out. You know, we had really kind of a low response from the audience. Two percent. Yeah, two percent <laughs> said that's, that's, that's low. That's low. Like, it's pretty low. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and granted, it's it's a complicated procedure as we've as we've been saying. So it's a it's a tough sell um, trying to get them to do this. So I understand. But at the end, after they had walked through it on their phones, you know, working in pairs, going through this. Sim- sampling simulation, um, they were much more willing to give this a try in their uh, natural business practice and um, were really willing to share their data with others. So part of what we did um, in that study is that, you know, as they're recording the presence of aphids in their uh, fields, which we had them randomly pick a field that they would normally go to, and we actually had them uh, put that location onto a map as part of this app. Uh, 
And so after we were done with the simulation, we had all of this data that was taken saying we had aphids across Oklahoma State. And we put this map up on the, the big screen for them to see. And they all of a sudden realized that they could see everybody else's data in the state where they had aphids present. And they saw the benefit of sharing that data. Um, so they you know, really got an understanding of, of how they can use that um, you know, if that's, hey, my, my neighbor's got, or maybe not my neighbor, but the county next to me has this, so I better get out and take a look because it could be um, good for my clients to be alerted to it. So. And, and extension agents as well can be looking at that going, oh, there's a lot of activity within my county. This is maybe now how I should be putting my programming together for this coming, this coming week. So my blog, my tweets, all that should be actually directed towards, hey, here's a new sampling plan, or here's, here's how you identify green bug within wheat, knowing that there's some general activity of that pest within their area. So again, the sharing, it just doesn't benefit the, the stakeholder. It also benefits the agents who are also trying to help those stakeholders be more informed. So again, the, the whole idea of how do we share data as much as we can and as comfortable as they can be, and that's really the challenge here. So the the other element to this was the actual, I don't know if we want to call it a training, but the experience that they got, right? The guided experience and and how that made a how that might have made a difference in the adoption of the digital tool. Can you talk about that a little bit, Brian? Yeah, yeah. You know, and, this, and this is just the, I mean, I've got a extension appointment, it's in digital delivery, mobile technology. I also have a teaching appointment, but I mean you know, and then the rest of it's, the rest of it's research, but really hundred percent of what I do is teach. And I, I love the teaching element to it. Uh, to me, I mean, most of my, most of my students, I, I feel like I need to give them some type of hands-on experience for, for these concepts to really sink in. So for us to have them simulate pulling a bean out and looking at it and making a decision versus kind of the sage on the stage approach, which is me saying, Hey, here's a sampling plan. Here's how you use it. Here are the benefits here's this, here's that, and then walk away going, yep, we're still at 2% willing to use this. Versus, okay, let's give them something tangible that they can fill out, they can, they can it's, it's, it's a personal investment in, in this idea that you're trying to pitch, but they're using their own experience to, to decide whether or not this is something they wanna even consider. And I think the more that we can do that in our extension program, the more, the, the more uh, support we're going to get from our stakeholders as far as the direction we're taking our program. Um, that, you know, and, and we do that in the field. We try to, we try to, do, we try to include that philosophy, not just in this, this particular study, but when, when we go do field schools, can, is there a way that we can kind of give them a chance to experience this or provide some of their own feedback to help direct where we think this project should go? Um, and if they're not, if they're not personally invested, uh, it becomes a real challenge for us to kind of guess what's what's, what's going to be really adopted. Um, anything, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I do. So we also had the chance to use that large group as a focus group, really, because, you know, we, we had spent um, several months designing this mobile app to go through and sample and record observations, but we really did it with just me looking at it, you know, looking at my phone. And we had realized that, you know, uh, I'd helped develop these little check boxes that fit my finger. You know, it wasn't a big deal for me to go through and hit these little check boxes on my phone. And then we sat down with this large group of mostly men um, uh, who had a really tough time trying to hit these little boxes with their big fingers. <laughs> and so it ended up being a huge hang up throughout this, uh, throughout this sampling. And we immediately made the change when we got back to, back to campus that we had to re redesign that. So we have these big buttons that are really easy to hit for any user who could, you know, either show that something was present or not instead of these little check boxes. So and that was huge because if, if we had led, if we had left it with these little check boxes, nobody was going to use it. It would have been too difficult. Um, so it, it worked out really well for us to have a large audience to just test it and give us feedback on what was not working. You know, as you guys are talking about the sharing of, of data uh, between growers and, and across regions, um, both in the, in the project that you wrote the article about and, and as you're talking about the current project that you're working on, um, what, what is the, do you have a sense of what the hesitation is? Is it just 
Is it just too hard to share the data? Or is there some, um, something that some growers feel like, hey, I'm competing against this person, you know, this is, uh, we're both in business and, you know, competing against each other. Is there any element to that or? How much time, how much time, <laughs> how much time do we have, Bob? Uh, um, we have as much no, time as you want. Yeah. Do we want to exp explore the psychology <laughs> no, of uh, agriculture in America? That's really a huge, a huge uh, hot topic right now, not just within, you know, what we've been talking to our stakeholders about, but just this idea of, bit of you know, kind of big data and, where's this going and who owns the data and what we're going to do with the data, all, all that, you know, what we're talking about is kind of small. My, my joke is, you know, we talk about the big data, but we don't really do small data very well, nor do we talk about it. Um, you know, all these things that would have went, that would have went into a sheet of paper um, is probably not going to make or break somebody as far as if that, if that data got out, but still that little bit of data can actually go pretty long way pretty far, pretty, can go pretty far when it comes to making a decision over across the region. So again, where, where we had kind of potential hangups with our, with our stakeholders in these conversations was, okay, you want to share data. And most of them were hesitant until they asked you, well, what, what are you going to do with it? And so if I'm going to give you my GPS for a field that I told was infested, are you going to be telling my, my neighbor who's also looking at this piece of ground that's rented and saying, Hey, this farmer does a really poor job because he always has infested fields. Therefore, I'm going to, I'm going to do a better job with this rental property. Those, those, I mean, those, I'm not making that story up. We've, we've heard that a few, we've heard that a few times. So when we talk about sharing data, we talk about scrubbing out a lot of the things that are going to make growers feel, feel uncomfortable about sharing. So when we say, Hey, this, this infestation has happened at a County level, all of a sudden they go, okay, yeah, I'm willing to share that. That's, that's fine. It's not going to, it's not going to identify me. Uh, in the grander scheme of things. At the same time, what we're pushing with our overall tools, the more detailed data you give us, you know, this decision, decision support tool becomes much more meaningful to you. So we're trying, trying to teach them there's a balance between how much, how much you provide us and how much then you expect to get back. That's really specific to your farming operation. So it really is a balance. And I, I don't think, I don't know, I don't have a good answer for that now. I mean, there's there's a lot we still need to figure out as far as, you know, the bigger data, um, who gets that, who gets access, who owns it, uh, what happens to it at the end of the day, how does it get used? Is it being used against them? These are all really valid questions, but I'd, I'd, I'd still encourage, you know, especially those listening that the, even the, the small data, let's just start there. What are we doing with our field trial data? What are we doing with our demo plot data? How are we making that more accessible to people where and when they are, you know, and that's, I think those are all little things that we could be doing a better job. At least I think, I think we can. Um, and we're trying to without having to get really down to the nitty gritty of, you know, the, the big data on your, in your, in your X, Y coordinates and identifying you as a, a good or bad, bad grower. I think that, you know, that, that's the fear side of thing to me. Let's just keep it really simple at this point. Right. Uh, Wendy, can you talk a little bit about the tool? I guess we, we've, we've talked about the tool that you guys developed is in sort of just very generic terms. Is it something that's accessible to, pe accessible to people publicly or? Uh... Yes, so we are uh, myfields.info, myfields.info. That was that clear? Yeah. You want to say it good. again? Okay. <laughs> so, we'll, we'll add it to the show notes too. So yeah. awesome. Things, so. Um, so, and and the first thing you'll notice when you get to that website is that it's not covered in Kansas State University. It's not purple power cats. Um, it's it's really a multi-state project, and there's plenty of room for um, any region that wants to get involved. Um, there is places on, on specific pieces of information on the site where we can do some branding and, and you'll see that because uh, it's really an opportunity for a user to customize their research or not research, their extension experience. So um, if I'm a grower in Kansas, I can tailor what I'm looking at to information that's relevant to Kansas and I can see management guides for um, cutworm and wheat that are specifically provided by Kansas. Kansas State. And I can also find in the same spot, uh, Oklahoma um, State, if I want to. It's all, again, based on user preference. Um, so, so there's essentially, it's a, a big application for customizing um, as well as um, pushing information to the user. So we're still in our infancy. 
Um, we're still in development, but where we're headed is, a, is really a place where, um, tell us what interests you, which crops you're planting, what pests you've dealt with in the past, and then if you give us an email address, we're going to start pushing information to you. I mean, this is the, the social media experience we have now. Notifications when something is relevant to you. Um, so you would get an email back saying there's new information, new recommendations, new insecticide available that's recommended for such and such and such. Um, and it's not, just, uh, it's not just insect pests. I know we're nerdy entomologists, but we have a whole team at K-State that's um, um, is helping us out with tools that are specific to weed management and um, what, al what else am I forgetting, Brian? Uh, agronomy. Cultivar, cultivar selection, herbicide selection, yeah. um, insect pest diagnostic, diagnostic guides. Very, very simple, but again, uh, the pest sampler, which is really what uh, I mean, what we've been talking mostly about today, that experience was the paper version, now it's the digital version. Uh, that's within our pest sampler module, and there's um, some, you know you can sample for soybean aphid has has a has a uh, sampling plan in there. Uh, green bug, the glance and go is in there. Um, as new as new, like like Wendy said, if somebody wanted to participate and say, hey, I have a sampling plan, I think I could really I could really push through something like myfields.info. Um, you know, the whole idea is you don't have to go out and build a brand new site that is kind of thinking this way. Uh, it's just learning how to be a contributor to to that, and so we have a you know we have a module, we have something in place at least uh, the foundation for it. Uh, what we're really asking for is people to see that as a way to connect and and push their you know, push we, their tools. Yeah, out. we really like it because it's it's really a playground for us to work with our agronomy people and pathology people, which we really haven't had much of a place to come together and, and pull these ideas and tools together in the first place. So this has been um, pretty exciting for us. The, um, the funding was really for pushing case, uh, Kansas information, but like I said, it's not branded just for K-State, so we're pulling in people from other regions to help out too. So really trying to enhance our scope. Well, it sounds like a great tool. Thanks so much for your, your work on it and your, your article in, in Journal of Extension and for uh, joining us today on the, on the podcast. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for giving us time to talk about it. Uh, Associate Professor Brian McCornack and As Extension Associate Wendy Johnson are with the Department of Entomology at Kansas State University. We've been talking about their article, Getting Growers to Go Digital, the Power of a Positive User Experience. You can find it in the journal of extension, joe.org. Thanks for joining us for the podcast. As always, hit us up on Twitter. It's at WD and EXT. All the podcasts are on SoundCloud, soundcloud.com slash working differently. And the show notes at bobbirch.com. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great day.